presents Square One TV, show number 162, produced at Unitel Video in New York. fight against injustice and crime, there is one name that stands out among the rest. Impeccably neat, always well-groomed, he stands as a perfect example to others. A pillar of strength against the forces of evil and danger. Who is this giant among us that stands for all that is good and wholesome? It is none other than... Super, Super Guy! And now, the adventures of... Super Guy! Richard, looks like we got the customer. Welcome to Fruit Nuts Forge and beautiful downtown Tierra del Frizo. Looks like you flew into some trouble, eh? The flock of Canada geese. Look what it did to my lightning bolt. Ooh, I bet that you're flying, huh? I had to fly upside down most of the way. By the way, my name's Super Guy. Boy, it's hot in here. I've been trying to do that for one week. You know where I can get a lightning bolt fixed? <laughs> Well, you come to the right place, but we're very busy. You'll have to take a number. Number? That's uh -huh. right. Right over there. We try to be fair. Oh, like in a bakery. Number 94. Number one! Number one! There's nobody else here. This is ridiculous. You will have to wait your turn. Number two! Number two! You gotta be kidding. I'm the only one here. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so a flock of geese got to you. How did you know? Well, it uh, happens a lot this time of year, but I can fix it. What you'll need is a Model 36 polished blip tight. Should last about forever. Give it to me and pay my way. Super. Here's my lightning bolt. Thank you. Follow me into my office, please. How much do I owe you, ma'am? That would be 80 troops. I beg your pardon? 80 droobs. That's the money we use in Tierra del Frizo. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have any droobs with me. I only have dollars. <laughs> oh, I will be more than happy to exchange your dollars for droobs. Oh, well, how many dollars equals 80 droobs? The rate of exchange is 5 to 1. Oh, 5 to 1. What does that mean? That means that there are 5 droobs to every dollar. Great. Well, here's your dollar. Wait a minute. And, uh... What did you say your name was? Super Guy! You didn't give me enough money. Oh, well, here's the other dollar. Oh, Hint, you don't understand. Neither do I. <laughs> Each dollar is worth five drubs. Look! <laughs> we don't only deal in lightning, we also deal in thunder. Boy, you guys have lots of fun down here. <laughs> now you owe me 80 troops, and you have only given me one dollar, which equals five troops. What kind of Viking are you? I gave you another dollar after that. Two dollars equals ten troops. Mm. The ratio of dollar to troops remains the same. Well, what if I were to double my offer? Four dollars. Four dollars. Hint, 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 hint. Four dollars is 20 troops. Wait a minute. I think I get this. When you double the one, 
the other doubles also. Let's see. One to five, two to ten, four to twenty. Now, then if I double the four dollars, the droobs would double from twenty to forty. You got it, super guy. Let's see. Then I would double the forty droobs to get the eighty droobs I owe you. Uh -huh. Then I would have to double the eight dollars and I owe you. Sixteen dollars. <laughs> That's because there's a five to one ratio and five times sixteen is eighty. Well, here's your sixteen dollars. Oh, thank you. Oh, and could I have a receipt? Lightning bolts are tax deductible and very cheap. Well, it doesn't cost very much to live in a cold water cave in beautiful downtown Tierra del Friso. It's very nice. Oh, we're very proud of it. Uh -huh. Now, you gave me sixteen dollars, I give you eighty droops. One a droop, a two a droop, a three a droop, a four. Why don't you just keep hold of them? I only have to give them back to you. So why don't you keep hold of the droop? Okay. Oh, you're too kind. Here you go, young fella. Here you go. Oh, that's nice. Now, with these, you should hold up for quite a while. Now, it might have a tendency to uh, be very stiff at first and, and have a tendency to pull to the right. So be sure to compensate for it. Okay, well, thank you, Fruppner and Fishnet. Fruppner, and what did you say your name was? Fruper Guy. Super Fry. Super Guy! Nice, love you. <laughs> well, so long. Uh, oh, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Nice, thank you, thank you. Are you all right? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Well, you were right when you said this lightning bolt would pull to the right. I better uh, go outside where there's more room. Thank you. By the way, before I leave. Well, happy forging. That guy, and what does he do for a living? I don't know. Robin Hood is an English legend who lived in Sherwood Forest in the 12th century. You should read about his exploits, and you should listen to Mr. John Mashita. While you're listening, keep your eye on the rate of speed. Once upon a time, in a place called Sherwood Forest, there lived a famous outlaw named Robin Hood who wore tight green tights and who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. One day, Robin runs into a big guy named Little John. They hit each other with stout staffs. Ooh, ah, ow! And then Little John joins the merry men and puts on some green tights, too. Next, our sharpshooter from Sherwood steals a mutton joint from Friar Tuck and pushes him into the river. Then everybody laughs. Ho, ho, ho! They're not called merry men for nothing. Meanwhile, back at Nottingham Castle, the evil sheriff signs a death warrant for a fearless hero in green. But nobody can catch Robin, so the sheriff comes up with a plan. Let's have a bow and arrow contest and get that green guy. So our able archer arrives in disguise. Robin shoots his arrow. Bing! Wins the golden arrow. And goes straight to jail. Maid Marion helps Robin escape, but the merry men shoot lots of arrows. Ho, ho, ho! And everybody rides horses back to Sherwood. Meanwhile, back at the castle, the sheriff of Nottingham throws Maid Marion in jail. But wait! It's Robin Hood to the rescue. Robin runs into King Richard the Lionhearted, who's on his way back to the castle, too. So they all storm the castle, shoot all their arrows. And everybody gets what they want. Robin gets Marion, Marion gets Robin, Richard gets his throne back, and Robin Hood gets to hang up the green tights for good. It may sound silly, but this man has a problem with his apples. Let's see if he can solve it. Well, I'm a pretty smart cat, and I know they say that an apple a day keeps a doctor away. But you gotta help me, Doc. Here's what it's about. Got a bad apple problem, can't figure it out. Got an after school job at the bakery Peeling apples for the dude who makes the pies, you see Well, I can peel 40 apples in an hour flat But this chick named Maria can do double that I think I see the problem I know what you mean Maria's on a number on your self-esteem You consume a apple in me You're hostile and sore You feel she's all the feeling She's rotten to the core This afternoon, he 
Afternoon, noon, the boss said, I need 360 apples soon. I said, I can peel 40 in an hour, fine. But 360's gonna take me nine. Maria pops up, starts to laugh, says, I can do the job in only four and a half. The boss says, kids, give my ears a break. If you do the job together, how long's it gonna take? If we do the job together, how long's it gonna take? I think I see the problem. You're tense all the time. Your terrified her apple skills are gonna get you fired. As a consequence, you're crabby to Maria and your boss. You have this dream in which you crushed him into applesauce. Here's the deal, 40 apples in an hour's what I can peel. Maria can do 80, so together we got 120 apples in a one-hour shot. He needs 360, that isn't enough! Wait a minute, Doc, I'm working out this stuff. 120 in one, 360 in what? But that's several times as many as the apples you've got. Three times as many apples, three times as long. Three times as many hours if we're going strong. So take one hour and multiply by three, and that's three hours of working for Maria and me. I think I see the problem. But look at the clock. I solved my problem. See you later, Doc. Yes, I talked to the producers. And what did they say about getting a laugh track machine? They said they bought one. Oh, that's great. You're going to see, I'm going to be just as funny as those other game show hosts. <laughs> I don't think so. What do you mean? Well, when they plugged it in during rehearsal, yeah. it heard one of your jokes. <laughs> yeah. And then it reached over and unplugged itself. <laughs> <laughs> And now, it's time for America's favorite mathematical game show. But who's counting? And here's America's favorite mathematical game show host, Monte Carlo. Hi, 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 and welcome to But Who's Counting? Oh, what a nice audience. How many of you came here on a bus? Oh, great. Now, let's meet the contestants. And you are? I'm Bella Lagosa. And I'm Bonnie Lagosa. And, and you've, you've got, got a lovely neck. neck. <laughs> and uh, where do you hail from? It's a little beachfront town in California called Malibu. <laughs> now let's meet your opponents. And you are? I'm John. And I'm Ethel. Mabel. <laughs> mm. And uh, what do you do for a living? We are the greatest actors in history! <laughs> nice to have you with us. Now, let's meet the girl who lives next door to all our dreams, Amber Jeanette! Amber! Oh, there she is! Now, you all know how to play the game? Yes, we do! I'll tell you anyway. We'll choose five digits at random, one at a time. Your job is to place each of those digits on your scoreboard. Make one three-digit number and one two-digit number. When you're done, add them up, and whichever couple has the larger sum wins the prize. Remember, once you place a digit on your board... You, you can't move it. it! That's right. And of course, there will be a bonus prize for the largest possible sum. You folks at home, get pencil and paper ready so you can play along with us. Is everybody ready? Yes, we are. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Spin the wheel, Amber. Oh. It's a number nine. Ooh, that's nine. a great beginning, Amber. Number nine. <laughs> Second digit is number three. What great earrings, Amber. Did you make them yourself? Oh. That's a six. That's a six. Nice. Okay. On to the fourth digit. The tension's building here, folks. Oh. Oh. A five? Yes, it's a five. Okay, one more digit. The fifth digit is a four. A four. Okay, couples, add up your numbers. 
Now, while you're doing that, I just happen to have a fan letter here for Amber Jeanette. It says, Dear Amber Jeanette, I'm 11 years old and I love your show. How old were you when you decided to go into show business? Nine, nine. Okay, ready? Uh, total, please. Monty, we have a very delicious number. Yes, and Monty, by the way, we love the color of your tie. Thanks. <laughs> we have a beautiful number. It's 1,017. 1,017, bloody good number. <laughs> and your total, please. No, Monty, I'm afraid we've arrived at the rather paltry <laughs> sum of 999. Oh. 999. <laughs> Looks like the Lagosas win the game. Now, the best possible sum is 1,017. Lugosas, would you show the folks at home how you came to that number? Absolutely. Certainly, Monty. See, they added 964 to 53, got 1,017. Could you tell us your winning strategy? Absolutely, Monty. First of all, stay out of the sunlight. Not now, darling. <laughs> Secondly, always put the large numbers to the left. Not now, darling. But I'm thirsty. And the small numbers to the right. Large numbers to the left. Well, you win first prize, Lagosas. Electric tap shoes. <laughs> Second prize goes to the Merry Boars, the Brooklyn Bridge. And of course, the Lagosas win the bonus prize, an inflatable cow. <laughs> Well, that's all we have time for today. So bye-bye from... Who's Talking? Come on, go. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. This is the city, Los Angeles, California, 5.47 p.m. The day that began three hours earlier in New York was, as usual, tired by the time it got to L.A. We were working the day watch out of MathNet and were involved in a mystery, the mystery of the Maltese pigeon, a rare sculpture worth a king's ransom. We'd been asked by its owner, Maureen O'Reilly, to make the exhibition room in the museum secure. Ms. O'Reilly felt there were men, desperate men, who wanted to steal it from her. My partner is George Frankly. The boss is Thad Green. My name is Monday. I'm a mathematician. We decided to look at a couple of scenes from yesterday's show to refresh our memories. What times will your exhibit be open, Ms. O'Reilly? From five to eight for the next three days. Three hours a day for three days. That's a total of nine hours in all. If we move 50 people in and out in, let's say, what's a good guess? I don't know. How long would you guess that people might like to look at the bird, Ms. O'Reilly? Well, I suppose that depends on how fascinating they find it. But as a rough estimate, I'd say five minutes. OK. 50 people in five minutes. There are 12 five-minute segments in one hour. That's 12 groups. 12 groups of 50. 12 fives are 60. So 600 people can see the bird every hour, Ms. O'Reilly. Oh, that would be a thrill. We knew we had secured the Maltese pigeon, and it was beyond any danger. And then we got a phone call. MathNet, frankly. Oh, <laughs> hello, Marine. How's everything? What? We'll be right there. What is it? The Maltese pigeon has been stolen. We went back to the exhibit room at the museum to look for some facts. The bird was taken from a locked room which no one could get into or out of. Two questions. Who did it and how? Steve, are you absolutely positive that no one entered? That's right, George. And no one came through Sam's door either. Impossible! Someone had to not only get in, but also get out with the bird. When did you miss it, Miss O'Reilly? Well, we opened the doors at exactly 5 p.m. I was the first person into the room, leading the first group of 50 people. The door opened, and my bird was gone. What did you do then, Maureen? Well, I'm afraid I did something rather untoward. She screamed. Then she fainted. Are you all right? I mean, you didn't faint on anything, did you? Who do you suspect might have taken it? It had to be either Jasper Stoutman or Noel Sphinx. Who are they? The two desperate men I was telling you about in yesterday's episode. Stop at nothing? The same. 
They've been after the Maltese pigeon for nearly 15 years. They've traced it to the four corners of the earth. But what makes you sure it was them? Or they? It had to be. They're the only ones who know the true value of the bird. Could you give me its dimensions? Perhaps we could figure out exactly what it's worth. Well, it's about 11 inches long by 6 inches high. It really doesn't matter, George. It's a priceless piece of art. Priceless? Doesn't everything have a price? No, there are some things on which you can't put a price. It's hundreds of years old, it's delicate crystal, and it's glass encased as a fantastic sapphire. I see what you mean. George, Kate, I found this young man snooping around the exhibit room. I meant no harm. I was just curious. It can't be. What do you mean, Miss O'Reilly? His name is? Noel Sphinx. Junior. Then you have a father. Named Noel Sphinx. Senior, yes. Yeah, senior. And you know this young man, Miss O'Reilly? I know, knew. He looks like a man I used to know. A man who is in hot pursuit of the Maltese pigeon. Yes, that was my father. He died in his quest. I'm terribly sorry. My brother had a 72 quest. Got bad mileage, but said it handled well. Is it true your father was on the trail of the Maltese pigeon? Oh, yes. It was his mission in life, and now it is mine. No, well. Don't begin this insanity. You're young. You have your whole life in front of you. She's right, Noel. I know, but I need the bird. Then how do we know... Know what? That you don't already have it. How do we know you didn't steal the bird? If I had, would I be here now? He has a point. But who then? The stout man. The stout man, Jasper Stoutman, the man I was speaking of. Yes, but how do we know he was here? I'm sure he was. I felt it in my bones. Your bones felt right. He was here. I saw him drive up. Know where he lives? No. I've been looking for him and he can't be found. Noel, did he come into the exhibit? No, ma'am. He looked at the commotion going on and drove away. Rats. Sure wish we had his license plate number. What's this? Maybe it's Stoutman's license plate. I doubt it. It's too small. We talked with Debbie Williams, head of our computer lab. We asked her to check the license number Noel had given us in hopes of finding an address for the Stoutman. Jasper Stoutman. Any luck, Debbie? Just a minute. I've accessed a database of the Department of Motor Vehicles. What will they give you, Debbie? The computers at the DMV have records of every car registered in California. They can tell us who the car with the license number ADX21N belongs to. Where that someone lives? That's right. What have you found? Here it is. ADX21N is owned by one Mr. Jasper Stoutman. And your computer has an address on him? Here you go. Number one, Cherry Blossom Lane. That's in Hancock Park. Pretty fancy neighborhood. Uh-huh. It's where Pia Zadora lives, I think. Thanks, Debbie. Let's get Maureen O'Reilly and pay Mr. Stoutman a visit. George and I drove quickly but carefully to the address Debbie had pulled for us. The neighborhood and Stoutman's house were nearly as impressive as Stoutman himself. Mr. Stoutman? Yes, it is I. <laughs> Monday. Frankly. Mathnet. Maureen O'Reilly. <laughs> well, sir, as I live and breathe, Miss O'Reilly. It is you, by Gad. May we speak with you, sir? Certainly. Do come in, please. <laughs> The home's interior screamed out in an understated elegance. Do sit down, please. Let me guess the subject, if I may. 
Now then, it's about the bird, isn't it? What makes you say that, Mr. Stelman? <laughs> a man with a question. I like a man who asks a question straight out, shows he doesn't have the answer and isn't afraid to admit it. Ask questions all your life, young man. It's a good way to get answers. <laughs> How did you know we were interested in the bird, sir? Miss O'Reilly gave it away. It's all she ever thinks about, talks about, does anything about. Isn't that right, Miss O'Reilly? Yes. Stoutman, I have a question about the Maltese pigeon. Where is it? I believe it was you who purported to have the bird. Didn't I read somewhere that you were going to exhibit it? I was going to, but it was stolen. <sighs> How very unfortunate. Have you a suspect in mind? She thinks you took it, Mr. Stoutman. Get! <laughs> you are a character, sir. No beating around the bush. I like a man who... I want it back. I don't have it, and you know I don't have it, my dear Miss O'Reilly. And I'll tell you something else. What's that? You never did have the bird. Yes, she did, Mr. Stoutman. I saw it. Impossible! What you saw must have been a fake. I don't have the bird. <laughs> Feel free to search the house and grounds if you wish. I must away. I have an important meeting. It wouldn't by any chance be with a young man named Noel Sphinx. <laughs> At Mr. Stoutman's request, we searched his house for the bird. We looked everywhere and came up with nothing. We dropped Ms. O'Reilly off at her place of business, a swanky catering company specializing in Nouvelle cuisine for the rich and famous. She thanked George, bid us adieu, and we called it a day. Next morning, we got an early start. This problem is getting more and more mysterious, George. I would have sworn that Stoutman had the bird. But he didn't. Well, that leaves the kid, Noel Sphinx. Maybe we ought to pick him up for questioning. Good idea. Maybe he can give us some facts. Frankly, MathNet. Oh, yes. Good morning, Mr. Stoutman. What? I see. We'll be right out. Stoutman? Uh-huh. He had the Maltese pigeon after all. Well, the case is solved. Let's go get it and give it back to Ms. O'Reilly. Good idea, except for one thing. While he was out last night, someone stole a pigeon from him. <laughs> what is this? It's just a chocolate chip cookie. That's right! The most precious material on this planet! Mr. Stoutman, why is that bird so valuable? There are probably lots of crystal pigeons in the world with sapphires in their tummies. <laughs> Not likely, Mr. Frankly. 100% of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. <laughs> this program was made possible by grants from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Corporate funding is provided by IBM. At IBM, we believe education is the key to the future. We are pleased to help support Square One TV as an innovative way to introduce young people to the exciting world of mathematics.